Hi everyone, welcome to our talk, Apache Spark on Kubernetes, best practices and performance tuning. I'm excited, you know, to be with you at Cloud Native Data Management Day. A few words about me, I'm Jean-Yves Stéphane. I've been working with Spark as an infrastructure provider for more than six years now. First, as a software engineer at Databricks, then as the co-founder of Data Mechanics. And Data Mechanics is now, is now a part of Spot.io, we were acquired this year. And I'm the product manager for Ocean for Spark, uh, the fully automated, optimized Spark on Kubernetes platform we're building. Before diving into the topic, why are we excited about Spark on Kubernetes? What's the general context? Well, as you know, uh, being you know cloud native, Kubernetes has become the standard infrastructure layer for general purpose compute, and it brought lots of improvements: higher velocity for teams, better development workflow. Uh, serverless infrastructures, uh, more flexible, more cost-effective, cloud agnostic. But uh, this was great for the general purpose compute, but in the big data space, the adoption of Kubernetes has just begun. And most big data platforms, most big data teams still rely on VMs and bash scripts at their core. Uh, most data teams are not that familiar with the cloud native stack. Uh, and so, you know, Spark and Kubernetes became available a couple of years ago. And to me, it really feels like it's time for big data to benefit from the DevOps and containerization revolutions uh, rather than stand apart in its own, you know, island uh, with outdated tools. Um, so what are we going to talk about? First, I'm going to introduce Spark on Kubernetes. What are the core concepts, the benefits, uh, the, the history of this journey? And then we're going to dive into the meat of the topic, best practices and performance tuning. We're going to go over different, you know, technical topics. It should be pretty hands-on. And we'll finish with an outlook at what's coming up in the next version of Spark, which is Spark 3.2. Great. So first, a few words about Spark. Uh, Apache Spark is the number one analytics engine for big data and AI. What made Spark popular is that it's really fast. It can process large volumes of data really quickly. Uh, you know, much more, much, much faster than the previous uh, technologies like Hadoop. Second, it's pretty easy to use Spark because there are um, high-level uh, APIs in Python, Scala, and SQL, Python being the most popular these days. And last, it's very versatile. So it's really the, the Swiss army knife of big data. You can use it, of course, for batch ETL processing, but also for streaming. Uh, and it's also popular as a data science tool, whether you're just doing some data exploration, whether you're building actual machine learning, uh, or as a BI tool. And obviously, it also plugs with the, the various data sources that are popular these days. Now, where does Kubernetes fit uh, within Spark? Well, Kubernetes is a new cluster manager for Spark, right? Because Spark can take some code and figure out how to distribute it across a cluster, you know, across several machines but it doesn't actually manage these machines. Um, Spark does come equipped with a standalone cluster manager, but you know, it has some limited functionalities. So then the other uh, popular cluster managers are uh, Apache Mesos, but it's now deprecated. There is Hadoop Yarn, which is the most widely used even today. And then there is Kubernetes, uh, which is definitely the most popular option among new deployments. So maybe to explain kind of the difference between uh, what most people do today, which is Spark on Yarn, and then Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, when you run on Yarn, uh, you're going to do a Spark submit, and you're going to talk to um, Yarn Resource Manager Master Node. Uh, what's important to know here is that Yarn itself will, will come equipped with a certain version of Spark. And so you end up with uh, a cluster, or a Yarn cluster, that has one specific Spark version. If you have different teams, or if you're trying to upgrade to different Spark versions, you need to have multiple clusters. You'd have a, a Spark 2.4 cluster, a Spark 3.0 cluster, a Spark 3.1 cluster. Uh, the other issue is that, uh, well, if the, your code does run into containers, but um, th these are not uh, Docker images, there isn't any native support for Docker images. Um, what most people do is they actually modify their AMIs to make system changes, and they and they actually use some init scripts, uh, like bash scripts, to install their dependencies at runtime. Uh, and that makes kind of debugging painful. You, you, lack, you lack a lot of isolation. And for that reason, in fact, um, what is recommended is to use transient cluster, meaning 
you bring up a cluster, you run your workload, and you finish your cluster. Uh, the only problem with that is that it, it increases costs because you know Yarn takes a lot of time to start up. You know you have to install all the JVM, you have to boot up all the system, so you you, you have to pay for that setup time. And then the other reason is that well, if it's a transient cluster, then uh, just one pipeline is going to run on it, but you're not going to benefit from sharing the underlying resources. Now with Kubernetes, what does that look like? Well, you still do a Spark submit and you still talk to Kubernetes master, like the API server, but then all your code is going to be packaged into Docker containers and these Docker containers contain Spark itself. So as a result, on the same Kubernetes cluster, you can run applications with different Spark versions. You can obviously also run Spark and non-Spark applications. You can mix different use cases, notebooks, batch jobs, streaming jobs, whether it's production or development. And you know that you have the isolation uh, that will guarantee that it will remain uh, stable. Uh, and then, you know, the other benefit of using Docker is that you have better uh, dependency management. You know, you control the image so you can just build the image that has all your libraries and, and then you can run that image, whether it's maybe locally for dev and testing or at scale on the Kubernetes cluster, and you know uh, things are going to behave as you want them to. Um, and in general, there is like definitely faster startup time. There is better resource sharing. There is also a lower um, mem a resource overhead. So overall, you should see some significant, uh, you know, cost savings. And uh, obviously, you will benefit from the, the cloud native ecosystem which is again uh, a standard cloud agnostic infrastructure layer that you can reuse across all your stack. So we've seen some of the benefits and we've seen the basic uh, architecture. Uh, let's talk about the Spark on Kubernetes journey. Well, the initial support was uh, brought with Spark 2.3 uh, early 2018, but it wasn't very stable. Uh, Spark 2.4 was a little better, it brought some some features that were critically missing, like uh, PySpark support and uh, volume mounts. And so you can start to run Spark on Kubernetes in production with 2.4. Uh, but for me, I would say the, the biggest improvement feature-wise feature -wise was in Spark 3.0 in 2020 uh, that brought dynamic allocation, uh, as well as, as other many bug fixes and performance improvements. Uh, so much that, you know, this year with the latest version, uh, Spark 3.1, Spark on Kubernetes was declared uh, generally available, and obviously uh, in parallel we saw more and more adoption. Many more people started using it, uh, and so and so that's why uh, it is now declared fully production ready and uh, GA. Um, there is one tool I want to talk about because it's pretty popular for people who use Spark on Kubernetes. It's the Spark on Kubernetes operator. Uh, it's an open source project that was originally you know, built by Google, but definitely works on top of any platform. And um, it's not just maintained by Google, but by the community. Um, what it provides is that it lets you manage Spark applications on Kubernetes as a Kubernetes object. And so, you know, you can use kubectl to describe them, uh, to even uh, kill them, restart them, schedule them. And it provides a few additional uh, features that make you know the use of Kubernetes objects simpler, like uh, configs, maps, uh, volumes, affinities. Um, really, I would really recommend you know using it. Uh, the only downside is that it is a long-running system pod, so it is a pod that needs to run on your cluster all the time, and so it's something else that you need to maintain. Uh, but overall, you know, like many other companies, um, we made the choice to build on top of it, and uh, we're pretty happy about that choice. Um, so. Maybe to, to recap some motivations for running Spark on Kubernetes, uh, a single infrastructure layer across your stack, uh, better, better developer development workflow with Docker images, better UX, um, lower costs, uh, no vendor lock-in, and definitely it's the technology everyone is building upon, so it's a more uh, future-proof bet. Um, the only con is that, well, if you want to run Spark on Kubernetes open source, then there's a lot to set up, a lot to maintain. Um, and if you want to use a managed product, well, you have to look at maybe Amazon EMR or Google Dataproc, and they have some alpha or beta version or early version that run on Kubernetes, but they have lost a lot of their prior features because a lot of things had to be rebuilt. Uh, so, you know, this is the reason why uh, I started Data Mechanics and why with Spot.io, we're also building uh, a next generation Spark Kubernetes 
platform. Uh, now, I'd like to go into the meat uh, of our uh, agenda for today, uh, so giving you some best practices and performance tuning advice for running Spark on Kubernetes. First, we're going to talk about cluster auto-scaling and dynamic allocation. So, you know, how you can make sure that instead of having a fixed size cluster, your uh, cluster is going to go up and down based on the load. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, leveraging spot instances, you know, that are cheaper. And there were some recent improvements with Spark 3.1, and in fact, more improvement coming with Spark 3.2 that, that help with that. And then we're going to talk a bit about performance tuning, uh, typically how to get the best performance for shuffle heavy workloads. All right, now let's talk about auto scanning. And first you need to understand that there is two levels of auto scanning. There is auto scanning at the cluster level, the Kubernetes cluster, and then there is auto scanning at the level at the level of each Spark application, which we call dynamic allocation. So at the cluster level, what you're going to do is you're going to define different node pools. So for example, one node pool could be uh, the M5 X large instances running on demand. And here in that node pool right now, we have two nodes. So we have two M5X large on-demand instances, each of them, you know, running different Spark driver, which could be of different sizes. Now, let's assume that this orange application finishes, and so the driver container and the, all the executor container too are removed. That node will become unused. And if you make sure that the, the node pool is auto-scaling, well, the node pool will uh, remove the unused node. And obviously it can go down and it can go up. Typically you, you can set a minimum size of zero and a maximum size of 100. And so really uh, this is nothing you know, specific to Spark, but this is how you know, auto-scaling works uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, there are some open source projects that do it well, like the uh, Cluster Autoscaler project. And uh, while scaling up, typically you can expect that in, in one or two minutes, you will get your additional nodes and they'll, they'll become available. So really the the scale up is pretty fast, you know, faster than uh, what we're used to on the yarn side. So that's, uh, you know, auto scaling at the level of the cluster. But then, you know, given a Spark application like the orange Spark application, you can also enable the config that's called dynamic allocation. And dynamic allocation will mean that you can add or remove executors at runtime based on the load. Okay, so you could say, oh, I want one more um, executor pod. And then that might mean we need to scale up this node pool at one node and then run that executor pod. Um, dynamic allocation on Kubernetes is only available since Spark 3.0. Uh, in Spark 2.4, it was not available. Uh, you can turn it, on, turn it on by switching these two config flags. So you enable dynamic allocation, but you also need to enable what's called shuffle tracking. So what does it mean? Let me first take a step back and explain what is a shuffle. So in Spark, a shuffle is whenever you need to uh, share, uh, exchange, uh, data across your cluster, across your Spark executors. So a, a reason why you might need to do shuffle is because you want to uh, compute an aggregation, you know, a group by by a different key than, than the partition key. Well, in that situation, you need to send the data across uh, the cluster. Uh, by the way, this is a pretty expensive operation, so Spark tries to minimize it, but sometimes there is just no way around it. Uh, there are two sides to a shuffle. There is the, the right side, where um, some executors are going to produce, you know, different files. And then there is the read size where, for example, you know, executor one will be pulling shuffle files from all the other executors. Um, now, um, you have to understand that, you know, shuffle files, they're very important. They're basically, they're your data. They're your intermediate results. Uh, you don't want to lose your shuffle file. If you lose a shuffle file, you're going to need to recompute the, the stage that produced it. Um, and so this mechanism, shuffle tracking, means that the Spark driver will be responsible for tracking where shuffle files are stored. And so that when you want to um, do a dynamic downscale, when you want to remove an executor dynamically, you will make sure that you do not remove an executor if it is storing an active shuffle file. You know, because if you were to remove an executor that has an active shuffle file, you would, um, you would lose your intermediate data and you would need to recompute it. Uh, so that's a bit of a limitation on dynamic allocation. We will see that it gets better with Spark 3.1 and Spark 3.2. But still, uh, even though there is this limitation, I would strongly recommend you to enable it, particularly if you're using Spark in an interactive setting. You know, if you're using Spark from a notebook, then it's important to enable dynamic allocation so that 
uh, your notebook um, executor scale down when the notebook is unused. It's really important in terms of costs. And now I'd like to go over a tip that can help you speed up dynamic allocation, but also speed up uh, general app startup time. Uh, we call that over provisioning. That means the Kubernetes cluster will always have uh, an, some additional space uh, so that you can start uh, pod, uh, pods really quickly. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to schedule a low priority pause pod. Uh, what does it mean? It means that it's a pod that does nothing. It's just here to take some space. And as soon as you start an app that has, you know, a normal priority that's higher, that pause pod will be removed and that space will become available uh, for your application. So in this example, let's say that we enable dynamic allocation and the driver requests, you know, one more executor pod. Well, that executor pod uh, will take the place of the pause pod. The pause pod will be evicted. Uh, this will happen really quickly. Really, it could be in a matter of seconds and, and your new executor is there. So it's, it's great. You know, you don't need to wait a minute or two for a new node to come up. But then the pause pod will be, will be indeed scheduled on a new node, you know, which will take a couple of minutes to come up. And so you will maintain uh, this little over provisioning. Um, by the way, this is a feature that we provide uh, on, in Ocean for Spark, and we call that Headroom. Uh, but you can also do it uh, just using open source tools. So here are the docs uh, about the cluster autoscaler that talk about over provisioning. And now I'd like to go over using uh, spot nodes. Uh, so, you know, spot or preemptible VMs are much cheaper, uh, but it can be difficult to use Spark on preemptible VMs. First, uh, the, the main thing that you need to be careful about is you need to put the driver on an on-demand node and only the executors on spot node. Uh, this is because the driver is a single point of failure. If the driver is gone, then your application fails. While if an executor for some reason goes down, then your application can recover from it. Uh, still, you know, you, you lose some of the work, uh, some of the work that was going on and some of the work that was stored in the shuffle files. And this is a new feature here that I want to talk about, a feature from Spark 3.1, which is called Better Handling for Node Shutdown. I think it's also called uh, Graceful Decommissioning. And this feature will kick in, uh, for example, when a node abruptly shuts down, so for example, because of a spot interruption, but it can also kick in during dynamic allocation, so during downscale of dynamic allocation. Uh, if it kicks in because of a a spot interruption, well, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to install a termination handler. Uh, there, are, there are different termination handler on Amazon, GCP, and Azure. It's basically a daemon set, so it's a small process that will run on each node, and what it will do is it will query the cloud provider API so that uh, it can be warned, you know, before the spot node uh, goes down, you know, because now Amazon gives you a two-minute notice. They warn you before they shut down your uh, spot node. And so what will happen here? So thanks to this um, node termination handler, you're going to know two minutes ahead of time that uh, the node and, and therefore the executor is about to be shut down. Um, Spark is going to listen to that warning. And first, it's going to stop scheduling new tasks on the executor. And um, it's going to um, make sure that if a task fails, it's not counted against a real failure because the, the failure will just be caused by the spot node going away. And now, you know, more interestingly, it's going to copy shuffle and cache data from the executor who's about to be removed to another executor, which will stay. Uh, and so this is the, the very important step where the, pre the precious shuffle files are copied so that they are not lost when the executor uh, is gone. And so, and so indeed, uh, now the spot kill happens and the Spark application can continue uh, with minimal impact because the shuffle files have been saved. Uh, now this feature is really great. I would really recommend it. Uh, there are a couple of caveats. So first, you know, if there isn't any executor, if it's, you know, you had only one, then, you know, there isn't any other executor to uh, give your files to. And for that, you can use, um, you can actually specify some kind of S3 bucket. So the data as a last resort will actually be uploaded to S3. Uh, another caveat is that when spot kills happen uh, really frequently really next to each other, um, 
it might appear, you know, to Spark that this executor is going away and then this executor is staying. And so Spark could decide to move the shuffle file from here to there. But then um, while, while it's doing this move, actually it understands that this, this node now is going away. And so th there can be this kind of race condition where um, even though, you know, you're trying to, to save your shuffle files, you, you are still going to lose them. So it's not, you know, 100%, but I would say in 90% of the time, you keep the shuffle file, so it's already a huge improvement, and it makes Spark on Kubernetes much more robust um, when using the spot nodes. Uh, and this is a feature, by the way, that only works with Spark on Kubernetes. It doesn't work uh, with Yarn because, you know, it requires some integrations with cloud provider, with daemon sets, and here this is where we see uh, the power behind the, uh, uh, the cloud native ecosystem. Great. And now I wanted to talk about one last topic, which is more about performance tuning. Uh, and before we talk about uh, this specific topic, a few words about performance. First, um, overall, you know, the performance of Spark on Kubernetes and Spark on Yarn are um, somewhat similar. Uh, so the benchmarks show that there is no, you know, pure performance uh, bonus or performance um, degradation to running on Yarn versus running Kubernetes. And second, most of the advice that you will learn about performance tuning for Spark will also apply on Kubernetes, you know. They will relate to uh, how you interact with storage. They will relate to how you build your code, and they still apply. Now, uh, here we're going to go into a topic that is uh, specific to Spark on Kubernetes. And it's about, uh, indeed, the shuffle performance uh, when you write data to disk. So when we talked about shuffle earlier, you know, I told you, indeed, the data is always written to um, files on the executor disk. And that is true. However, you can mount different types of volumes. So, you know, the executor could be writing to um, actually the, the um, file system of the node. It could be writing to uh, an EBS volume or a persistent volume claim that you attach. It could be writing to different actual volumes. And it's very important, in fact, to mount a volume because by, by default, otherwise, the, the Docker file system is kind of slow. Um, so by default in Spark 3.0, uh, the volume that will be used is an empty deer. It's basically, it's a temporary directory on the host. Uh, now, there is a tip. Uh, the main tip I want to talk about is to uh, mount a faster disk, uh, NVMe-based SSD, uh, which may be available on specific instance types. Uh, I'll show you on the next slide what that means. Uh, I should also mention that there's a third tip, you know, that could even have a better performance, but that is very dangerous, is you could actually mount a volume called tempfs, and actually, this will use uh, RAM, this will use memory, as if, as if you know, to write the data to disk. Uh, this is very dangerous because uh, Spark uh, obviously will not know it's using memory. It will just uh, write there as if it was a real disk. And so you are bound to get uh, to go out of memory. So, you know, do not use that for production workloads. But now let's, let's dive into the host path uh, thing. So um, you have certain instance types that uh, provide uh, local SSDs. So the, uh, on GCP, it's a toggle you can uh, switch on and off for each instance. On Amazon, it depends on the instance type. For example, instead of using M5, you're going to use M5D or R5, you're going to use R5D. And that means that you have a local NVMe-based SSD with a very high bandwidth. And then in your configuration, you're going to need to provide uh, something like what we see here on the right. Uh, so we're going to see uh, a volume mount where we're going to actually uh, mount uh, the volume and you're going to see uh, the host path that is going to define um, where, uh, the, where the volume is actually uh, written. And here, uh, this is GCP specific, uh, but you, you can find similar configs on Amazon. Uh, and then also in your Spark Conf, you're going to need to uh, set the Spark local deer config to tell Spark, you know, where... Uh, what is the scratch base it, it should use? What is the working directory where it should write the shuffle files? Okay, so here uh, you configure Spark to write there. Um, actually, you see it's a volume mount, and the volume mount will actually be writing on this path on the host. So this is how, how it all works together. Uh, so as you can see, it's not that trivial <laughs> to configure, but once you get it working, you can expect really great performance gain on your uh, workloads that are shuffle bound. And so we actually ran some benchmarks. We actually ran the, the TPCDS benchmark. And um, here on this graph, you will see uh, the difference in terms of query duration. 
so the ratio between the query duration, TPCDS query duration, between a configuration where we were just using, you know, um, uh, the base uh, disk available and the configuration where we had a local disk NVMe based uh, available. And what we can see here is that for a lot of queries where there isn't a lot of shuffle, there isn't really any difference between the two queries, you know, they, they kind of match. But once you go here on the right side, once the, the shuffle uh, read is in the uh, 10 to the power 4 or 10 to the power 5 uh, megabytes, then you can see a big difference in terms of query duration. In other words, um, attaching a local um, disk made the query run five times faster. Uh, so really this has a huge impact and particularly for the for the bigger workloads where you have you know massive joins and uh, and you're kind of shuffle bound you're spending most of your time you know writing the shuffle files to disk uh, this will have a huge improvement so really something to to look at of course you know we could go on and on about uh, uh, performance tuning uh, we have developed some tools you know at data mechanics at ocean for spark to to automatically improve some performance and also to give you the right insight to understand the Spark performance. Um, I'll, I'll give you some pointers to that if you're interested in, in going deeper. Uh, but I wanted to kind of finish our talk about talking about the future, in particular talking about Spark 3.2. Uh, at the time when I record this talk, it's not released yet, but it's about to be released, so maybe it's going to be released by the time uh, you view this video. Um, and um, first, uh, there are some very anticipated features that are not specific to Kubernetes. I can mention, for example, that Spark will now be uh, building on top of Hadoop 3.3, which will bring a ton of performance improvements, uh, particularly when you're reading from S3, you know, it might not seem so obvious, but you're actually using the Hadoop file system to read from uh, cloud storage. Uh, another anticipated feature that is not about Spark on Kubernetes is the push-based shuffle and uh, data source v2 improvements. But here, I want to talk a bit more about some Kubernetes-specific improvements. <coughs> One of them is um, better executor failure reasons in the Spark UI. So this is a screenshot of what the Spark UI will look like if you go to the executors page. There will be a new column that will show you uh, the error of the executor. And so far, because of an issue with Kubernetes, uh, we couldn't actually um, get a meaningful error. But now things have been plugged together and so you'll be able to see some really nice error messages here. Like this one says, the executor has exited with an exit code of 52, which means that the JVM, the Java virtual machine, ran out of memory. Uh, and so, yeah, this will be just much more useful to, to debug your Spark application, understand why an executor has failed. Um, something else I want to talk about, and this goes again uh, in the topic of uh, making Spark more robust when using uh, spot nodes and also in the topic of attaching different types of volumes to your Spark application. Well, um, um, we're going to talk about PVC, Persistent Volume Claim. Uh, since Spark 3.1, the Spark driver can dynamically create persistent volume claim and mount them in the Spark executor. So that means, let's say that you have enabled uh, dynamic allocation and so you're, you're starting an executor, well, you can dynamically, automatically create a PVC and mount it into the Spark executor so that the Spark executor will be using it as, as a disk, you know, as a volume, as we've seen earlier. And by the way, the PVC, it's a Kubernetes object. It can be backed by different type of physical volumes. It could be an EBS on Amazon, or it could be a persistent disk on GCP. And these volumes are automatically uh, cleaned up when the app uh, com completes. But now, with Spark 3.2, uh, the new uh, feature <coughs> is that uh, you may choose to keep the PVC uh, when the executor goes away. So let's say that the executor uh, is removed, maybe, uh, maybe it's, it ran out of memory, or maybe because of dynamic allocation it was removed. Well, the PVC, instead of being automatically cleaned up, will be kept alive and um, if the same driver starts a new executor, it might reuse this PVC for the new executor. So what are the benefits of doing that? One, it will speed up the executor creation because you don't need to create another PVC. But uh, more importantly, uh, the shuffle files that uh, were available to the first executor 
will also become available to the second executor. And that means that if if maybe the first executor death was due to a failure, you know, running out of memory, well, the shuffle files will become automatically available to the new executor. And so we're going to be able to recover uh, the shuffle files. So this makes Spark really robust to losing an executor. Uh, let's say uh, you had a spot kill, or let's say you had an auto memory error and your first executor uh, died. Well, now you're going to um, have a new executor start and that new executor is going to be able to read the shuffle files that were, that, were, that were written by the first executor. So here we're going you know, closer and closer to disaggregating compute and storage, which is really the best way to make a Spark at the same time performant and also uh, cost effective. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's it. These were some of the features I was excited about in Spark 3.2. So if you are also excited, uh, I put a few links here. Uh, first, there is our, our blog where you can see some interesting technical content about Spark and Kubernetes. Uh, we also uh, have built and we maintain, actively maintain, a fleet of Docker images for Spark. So these Docker images, they come built in uh, with lots of uh, dependencies, with lots of uh, connectors to different data sources, you know, whether it's uh, uh, all the cloud provider uh, object store, uh, whether it's um, uh, Snowflake, whether it's Kafka, etc. And these are available on Docker Hub. And uh, last but not least, uh, I also wanted to mention uh, an open source uh, monitoring tool that we call Delight, uh, which is available at this uh, GitHub. And this is a tool that you'll be able to plug in on top of Spark or Kubernetes open source or on top of a commercial platform, uh, one of the big platforms. It, it works on top of any platform and it will give you a monitoring UI where you can uh, get some insights about the performance of your Spark application, and and so hopefully uh, do some some you know some performance tuning even beyond the tips uh, we discussed today. Uh, and so in general, you know, I hope this talk was useful. I'm always happy to connect, uh, so I put uh, my uh, my contact here. So if you wanted to chat about Spark, happy to do so. Thank you very much.